<laughs> Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the special relationship between humans and animals in one of the world's most beautiful places, Hawaii. Our first segment is for the birds. I mean, ducks specifically. Evidently, they make great pets, but make sure you have lots of cleaning supplies. Then we witness the power of healing through therapeutic horsemanship. We'll find out what breeds of dogs are named after the butterfly and why. Plus, surfing canines, do they hang 10 or 20? Pets in Paradise TV starts now. It may surprise you, but ducks are near the top of the list of animal companions to humans. They make excellent pets for those who have a lot of patience and cleaning supplies. Aloha, I'm Kathy, and I'm unique because I have a pet duck. His name is Kalele, and uh, Kalele means to uh, strong or to trust, and he is about six months old. He's a male mallard. He doesn't quite know he's a duck, so shh, oh. don't tell him. And when you get a, a duck, you should get them when they're a little baby so they can imprint onto you. And Kalele was probably about the size of my hand. They're really fun because they'll follow you around, they'll think you're mama, and they, they just think you're the greatest thing in the whole wide world. Uh, people don't have ducks for a couple reasons. One, they probably don't have time to take care of a duck. Um, they actually need a lot of attention. And the other big factor is they're very messy. So far, no one has had much luck at house training a duck. The reason they frequently empty their bowels is nature's way of making sure a duck is light enough to fly at any given time. They also have hollow bones, hollow shafts and feathers to reduce their body weight when taking off for flight. But Kathy has found a solution to the mess. Velcro it together. Okay, he doesn't like this part. She uses a special duck diaper to keep her house clean. And then there's a center piece that goes up around the neck. Yeah. And now we have a diaper duck. Ducks have been domesticated as pets and farm animals for more than a thousand years. There are about 40 breeds of domestic ducks, but most descend from the Mallard, Muscovy, or Peking ducks. They're found in every part of the world, except Antarctica, where it's too cold for them. Some species migrate to warmer water, or where water doesn't freeze, so they can rest and raise their young. But in Kalele's case, he's found a warm, loving home right here on the islands. Okay, we'll get you your peas right over here. There you go. I wouldn't really recommend getting your duck used to junk food, because then they'll never eat anything else. Are you happy, bird? I see the tail wagon, so you must like them. If you have a pet duck, it's really important to feed them a healthy diet. In the wild, they are omnivorous, meaning they eat a variety of different plants and animals, small animals like insects and different bugs. You can feed them a, a balanced commercial diet that comes as a pellet, uh, or different types of grains, rice, corn, um, wheats, as well as vegetables and earthworms or mealworms. We do surf the internet together. Okay, Kalele, I don't think we're gonna be able to go to that website. You're typing too many letters. Come on, let's do what's on TV. A duck doesn't need a big pool or pond to swim in. It just needs enough water for food and hydration and a place to bathe. They keep their feathers clean by preening. There's a special gland that produces oil near the duck's tail and eyes, so when the duck coats the oils on his feathers, he becomes waterproof and helps keep him warm. Okay, Kalele, how about some french fries? You want french fries? Ready? Geese and ducks are said to be one of the most natural animal companions to humans because of a force in nature called imprinting. When a duck is hatched, whatever creature it sees that is larger than itself, the duckling associates as its own species. It basically imprints on the duckling's heart who its mama duck is and who it is. Hey, you want some french fries? Okay, we need to order some french fries for my pet duck. But sometimes it's hard to tell who imprinted on who. 
They'll snuggle with you, and they'll talk to you, and they'll surf the internet with you, watch TV with you, go to McDonald's with you. Go down slide. Whee! <laughs> you wanna do it again? Let's do Woo! it again. Push, come on. Here we go, whee! And the best part about having a dog is they'll eat your bugs in the yard. Good boy. Are you gonna beat me home? Are you gonna beat me home? Come on. Ducks first. Meet Lexi. She's a cute little thing and is a mix of two breeds. Look at those ears and those playful eyes. She's also quite talkative. Think you know what she is? We'll let you know in just a minute. If you think about it, Lexi looks a little like a Doberman, but she's not. She's half miniature Pinscher, a distant relative of the Doberman. But she's also half Chihuahua. Both breeds love to bark, so that's why Lexi is a little vocal. Both the Pinscher and the Chihuahua are similar in size, with the average height of both around 10 inches at the shoulder. Pinschers, though, are a little heftier, weighing in at 8 to 10 pounds. The Chihuahua usually weighs from 2 to 4 pounds. Lexi, a Chihuahua miniature Pinscher mix. For hundreds of years, horses have helped us get around, but they've also been helping us physically heal. The benefits of therapeutic riding date back to 17th century literature, where it's documented that riding was prescribed for gout, neurological disorders, and low morale. Today, horses are still helping people who suffer from physical and mental debilities. Let's head out to the east side of Waimanalo to learn more about therapeutic horsemanship. I, you know, I'm a third generation horse person. Um, my mom is a physical therapist, and that's another funny story. Actually, when I was a child, I was a toe walker, so I pat around on my tippy toes. My mom's a pediatric physical therapist, and she drove her nuts. And she thought, well, I could put her in horseback riding, and that'll force her to keep her heels down. And you know, I always remember that. And as I got into this later on, uh, when I was older, I was like, oh, mom, you were doing therapeutic horsemanship, you know, in the 70s. That's really cool. From there, Dana Venon took the reins and became involved with Therapeutic Horsemanship Hawaii, or THH, a nonprofit program that uses horses as tools to help people with special needs. Sarisa, can you turn your thumbs when in? When the horse walks, it moves the body through a natural walking gait and there is no other way to duplicate that in the therapeutic setting. There is no therapy ball that can do that. There's no therapy tool. There's no exercise on the mat that can do that. The horse is the only thing that can improve the human body's working gait like that. The program has proven to develop both strength and balance in adults and children with mobility issues. Okay, and everybody walk on back to the barn. Teresa, do you already have your shoes on? You got them zipped up? Mm -hmm. Okay, are you ready to ride? Mm -hmm. Okay. She had a traumatic brain injury at the age of two months old. All right. She got hit in the head with a football. She was in my arms. When she first got into horseback riding, it was really hard for her to reciprocate her feet while going up steps. And, but since she's been riding a horse, she has gained a lot of control and muscle tone within her trunk. And she can actually do a lot of sit-ups now. <laughs> and um, her posture is better. And she has since been released of physical therapy, by the way, and I think it has everything to do with horseback riding. She knows that there's something different about her. I was like, but you know what, Teresa? Everyone is not the same. I said, but what do you do that's so special? She's like, I ride horses. I said, and you do it very well. <laughs> so well, in fact, that Teresa's parents hope to get her a horse of her very own someday. Improvement on strength, balance, and mobility are not the only things THH offers. The program also gives family members hope. Before she was born, we already know that she has a problem that was telling me that she doesn't have a brain. We were told that she would not have personality. <laughs> she would not walk, she would not talk, she would not eat. 
So, uh, so it's, it's, it's a challenge, but we, we just believe that she will overcome, you know, and develop to her own potential. And that's exactly what little Teresa did with the help of THH. I took her here the first day, I met up with Dana. So Dana put her on the horse, just, just to go walk around the barn, and she would not get off. And at that time, she doesn't talk, but she signs. That's the first time she learned how to sign more. And then she keeps saying, she keeps signing more and more. And when Dana took her off the horse, she keeps going like this. <laughs> it's now been over 12 years since Teresa began riding therapeutic horses at Dana's ranch. Her core trunk and muscles have strengthened to the point where she can now stand on her own. Now that we have, it has helped her with her physical challenge, the next step is eventually she will learn how to ride a horse herself. In addition to physical improvements, horseback riding is also mentally beneficial. Of course, you know, you're riding something that's a thousand pounds, you're telling them what to do, and they're listening to you. How many kids do you know get to tell something what to do and have it listen? Um, I think that's a really empowering feeling, especially for young girls or women. Um, it's been an empowering feeling for soldiers coming back from overseas who feel kind of out of control, maybe PTSD or even physical injuries. Um, it's a chance to do something really cool. It's a chance to succeed and achieve, and I think it's a real huge confidence builder. And in the end, it's more than just the riders and family members that benefit from the program. I, I get to live the dream. I get 13 horses and as many goats as I can fit in that pen, and I get to be out here all day doing what everybody wishes they could be doing. <laughs> Definitely, I don't feel like I'm required to grow up here. You know, as long as I get the, the bills paid, I just play with horses and kids all day for the most part. So, pretty lucky person. Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV. There are over 500 dog breeds. In this segment, we like to focus on one and learn all about it. Today, it's all about the Papillon. The Papillon, which is also known as the Continental Toy Spaniel, is a type of spaniel that originated in France and is one of the oldest of the toy spaniels. It was called a papillon because of the shape of its ears and the long fringed hair. Papillon means butterfly in French, and that's exactly what the ears look like. But not all papillons have erect butterfly-like ears. Some are droopy, but that doesn't matter for show or deter from the quality of the animal. With droopy ears, the papillon is called a filet, or French for moth. Their lineage goes back hundreds of years, with its popularity documented in paintings from Spain and Italy, and have long been associated with royalty. The breed was brought to the U.S. in the 1800s and made it to the American Kennel Club in 1935. A papillon is a small dog, usually weighing between 6 and 10 pounds. They're usually white with markings of red, sable, black, or lemon. They're single-coated dogs, which makes them ideal in warm climates, not so good in cold weather. They do require moderate brushing up to two or three times a week. They have dark, medium-sized round eyes with thin black rims. The life expectancy of a papillon is from 12 to 15, but up to 17 years is not uncommon. As for health issues, papillons are sometimes prone to problems with the kneecaps, a condition that can be corrected by surgery. Papillons ideally do best with a fenced-in yard where they can romp freely, but for apartment dwellers and homes that don't have enclosed areas, daily walks are essential to take care of their exercise needs, and those that do are less likely to display behavioral problems. Papillons are excellent companions. They get along great with children and other pets, and even though they have a high energy level, they do become calm and can fall asleep in your arms or in your lap. They're very intelligent, self-confident, and great at learning new tricks. And now you know all about the Papillon. Welcome back to Pets in Paradise TV. Surfers have taken the sport to new levels over the years, from classic nose riding to cutting edge maneuvers like aerials. But now there's a whole new breed of surfers entering the arena.
Let's check out four of Hawaii's top surfing dogs. Meet Bongo, an Aussie-born Jack Russell, whose astrological sign should come as no surprise, she's a Pisces. In the beginning, to give Bongo a little bit more confidence, I push her from the outside and she see Deb, her other master, um, on the beach, so she, you know, she'd have a goal to go to. Today we have waves, you know, two feet or so, which is for humans, I guess, is, is, isn't much. But for a 10-inch terrier, that's double overhead. And Bongo's actually pretty smart. She'll, uh, she'll sit on, on the beach. If there's four or five waves coming in, she won't jump on the surfboard until all waves are gone. So she, she has a pretty good sense of, of knowing that there's surf coming in or not. You can catch Bongo riding the waves of Waikiki near the Waikiki Wall. Hoku is a laid-back kind of dog who enjoys tummy rubs and cruising in the waters near her home turf of Kailua. This is my dog Hoku and I like to take him surfing when I go to the beach. Otherwise he's bored at home and wreaks havoc. <laughs> <laughs> when I first started taking him surfing, we would just take him on a boogie board or you know a soft top Costco board. As he got bigger and bigger, we had to get bigger, floatier boards, and uh, we ended up, you know, with a stand-up board. You gotta love Hoku's laid-back style. It really helps if there's a pad on there because he, he doesn't like boards that don't have any grip. Basically, you treat your dog kind of like it was a little kid on the surfboard. You push him into the wave, but go on the back of the board and make sure it doesn't purl. Getting a dog out there through the waves, you just push down on the tail of the board as the wave comes along, lift the nose and it'll pop over, just like if you were teaching a kid how to surf. It's pretty fun to take your dog surfing. It's kind of a novelty act and, you know, the tourists are like, wow, look at that dog surfing. That's yeah, a lot of fun. Conversation starter. Meet Weave, a North Shore dog that used to be afraid of water and beer cans. He's gotten over the water thing, but not so sure about the beer cans. He was a little afraid at first, um, but he, he's such a social dog. Uh, he has to get involved, and as soon as he sees me paddling out on boards, he had to get on the boards too, so he's like, he's like the perfect uh, partner in crime. I tell him to move on the board, sometimes he's a little too far back, so I tell him to move forward, or I tell him when the waves are coming, like if he's not looking and we have to sort of, for him, duck diving, it's like the wave could be over his head. The biggest wave that he's ever surfed has got to be triple overhead or more, you know, probably quadruple overhead. But that doesn't scare Weave, he's a little dog with big plans. Future Weave is just going on, on the world dog surfing circuit, so <laughs> I think he's going to be killing it on there. So come on, all dogs, and come on out to the North Shore of Oahu. Ringo enjoys ice cream, cartoons, and surfing the South Shore. But what he doesn't like is bath time. Go figure. This is Ringo, he's my surfing dog, and this is his home break, White Plains Beach in Kalailoa. Ringo's a rescue dog, we had him for three years. Ringo's the only uh, surfing dog that I know that's dead that actually has sponsorship. Ringo is sponsored by uh, Surf Shooter Hawaii, and dead by shirt, he's a team rider. Gear for the sport is appropriate, so we make sure that Ringo has his life jacket and his goggles to protect him when he's out in the water. When I catch a wave with Ringo, I try not to turn too hard or he'll fall off and I'll lose them for a couple of seconds. My advice for teaching your dog to surf is make sure that the dog is comfortable. You want to bring him out in the surrounding. It isn't overwhelming to them. The way we can tell when Ringo's had enough is 
the excitement factor starts to go down a little bit. When we first start out, he's bouncing, he's full of energy. And towards the end, you can see his little feet get a little slower, and he starts hopping off more, and he starts swimming to shore. And then we know it's time for him to come in and drink water. Just like anybody else, he gets tired out there. My job as a sponsor is to get the exposure for you know, all my team riders too, so they can uh, obtain additional sponsorship. And uh, we even do this for Ringo. Ringo has some sponsorship uh, by myself and we're trying to pull in some uh, GoPro sponsorship with him as well. We'll learn the motivation behind a dog while it chases a Frisbee and how you can get yours to do the same. Then we'll get to know a 2,000 pound lovable pet that just wants his back scratched and wants to be fed. Watch your toes. Plus, they're called living jewels that can actually live over a hundred years. And find out how the beagle got its name. Here's a hint. Pets in Paradise TV starts now. Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV. Pets come in all shapes and sizes, from this furry little fellow to your best friend who jumps up and greets you with a wet kiss when you come home. But then there's Dakota. He doesn't fit the typical idea of a house pet, and he's definitely not the kind of pet you want to jump up on you. But he has definitely become a loving part of this family. We got Dakota about six years ago. Um, his mom died giving birth to him. We didn't bottle feed him, we fed him milk in a bucket. And he would slop that up and slurp it up in no time flat, two gallons. And from there, we weaned him off the milk, got him onto grass, and he's got 68 acres of, of freedom. He changes where he likes scratch the most every day, so sometimes he'll enjoy it. His throat is one of my favorite things on him. It's like the most jiggly part of skin. He pretty much was raised by my two daughters. They, they mothered him and uh, they're very attached to him. He's attached to them and he's just a pet. A 2,000 pound pet that is. Many aren't used to seeing a bull like this as a friendly giant. We often conjure up images of bullfighting, with bulls being provoked to charge a red cape. But a common misconception is that the color red angers bulls, when in fact, like most mammals, cattle are red-green colorblind. We go through a lot of trucks with Dakota around here. Um, what he does is uh, he likes to play with the truck. Dakota likes to get his aggression out on his toys. He'll tear doors off the truck. He'll get his head stuck in the window. It's just all a game for him and fun for him. So the trucks come in, I get them from friends. They come in decent shape. They just can't get safety checks for them or they're broken. And then Dakota, he does the rest. For the last six years, Dakota has lived a peaceful life, grazing the sweet grass of Kailua town. But unfortunately, his future is He's uncertain. Gone. Dakota. Hey, not very nice. That was rude. A lot of the animals that we have here, we have rescued. People didn't want them or they were hurt. Uh, we've had the 68 acres for about 40 years in our family, but unfortunately now we're gonna have to be leaving soon and are looking to find them a really good home. We have a petting zoo that might be interested in them, but other than that, we're hoping just to get them the best home that they deserve. Dakota just needs time, space, and some tender, loving care. He's a great pet, but he's not like a dog. You can't just pull him on a leash. He comes when he wants to. He does what he wants to, but he does it in the most calm demeanor. He's very laid back. He doesn't have an aggressive bone in his body, but he just, he doesn't understand how big he is. He doesn't realize he has horns, and he just doesn't think he can hurt you, and that's the danger and having a big animal, but he just wants to have the same affection as a dog. The bond that Dakota and his family share is rare. Bulls can be one of the most dangerous farm animals. At more than 10 times the size and 100 times the strength of us, it's not wise to let your guard down. 
But Dakota's owners have done a good job showing him who's boss, while at the same time cultivating his peaceful nature. The day in the life um, starts with me out working my job. Day finishes off down here with Dakota and his friends and the horses. We feed, we take care of everybody. The kids might ride. And um, normally we go home when the sun goes down. It's a good relaxing way to end the day. Keeps the mind good and it's good for the heart. There is a constant argument about fur and hair. What's the difference? And is hair really hypoallergenic? We'll have the answer shortly on this Pets in Paradise factoid. Some dog owners believe their pooch has hair because it doesn't shed much and is therefore hypoallergenic. But in reality, there's no chemical difference between hair and fur. The difference is in the phases of a coat's growing cycle. Some coats have fast growing phases and they tend to shed often and are considered fur. Other coats have slow growing phases and seem to hardly shed at all. Their coats are considered hair, but neither is really hypoallergenic. Allergies are triggered by dander, which are tiny flecks of skin that become loose when an animal sheds. If they shed often, there's lots of dander aroused and that leads to lots of sneezing and red eyes. If they seldom shed, there's less dander produced and as a result, fewer allergic reactions. To summarize, hair from a coat with long growing cycle phases is older and tends to feel coarse. Fur from coats that shed often is newer and softer, but neither are truly hypoallergenic. Now, more Pets in Paradise TV. There are more than 500 dog breeds ranging from the world's smallest to Chihuahua to the mighty Great Dane. Our goal is to pick one and learn all about it in It's All About the Breed. Today, it's all about the Beagle. One of the most popular breeds in the United States is the Beagle, a breed that dates back to the 1500s. In the United States, they were first recognized by the AKC in 1885. A National Beagle Club was formed in 1888. Beagles are members of the Hound Group. They're generally even-tempered and happy-go-lucky around their family. They do bark, but usually it's because they're confronted by strangers or strange situations. They need regular exercise because they are prone to weight gain. If you're a family that also has cats, good news! Beagles are considered to be one of the best breeds to get along with cats. Other facts about the beagle? Their lifespan is generally 10 to 13 years. Beagles don't drool. And in addition to barking, beagles also howl or bay. They got their name from the French word for bugle. That's because they do howl and their bay can be heard at great distances. Beagles are intelligent, but because they are so single-minded and determined, they can be hard to train. After being trained, they are obedient and are generally loving around a family, but can become distracted, especially by foreign scents. And they can detect many of those. Beagles, along with bloodhounds, have the best sense of smell of any dog. That's why they're used as detection dogs at airports and other import facilities. They're preferred at airports because they're cute and few people are scared of them. Because of that great sense of smell, beagles are also used to sniff out termites. As for characteristics, beagles come in a variety of colors, but the markings are usually consistent. They either have an all-white tail or the tip of their tail is white. That was bred into them intentionally so that when they're moving through brush, their tails will be easy to see. It's general consensus that beagles are one of the cutest breeds around a trait that is no doubt taken into consideration by the movie industry and cartoonists. They love to play together and enjoy time with their family or just sitting around. Get ready though, they want attention and lots of playtime. Okay, now you know all about the beagle. Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV. You may never look at a koi fish the same way. We'll learn more about the koi fish industry in Hawaii and around the world, and the significance of these freshwater fish kings. 
This is the Koi Show, the uh, Aloha Koi Appreciation Society show held in the Waikiki Aquarium. It's the biggest show in Hawaii and one of the major shows in the United States. There are around 40 show tanks here and probably around 350 top quality koi for people to view. Although these fish have now taken on a more ornamental role, their strength and beauty are still admired. Koi varieties are distinguished by coloration, patterning, and the smoothness of their scales. These are my fish. My favorite one is, is black and white. I love bl the black and white koi because they stand out so much. This is actually my uh, third one. Koi fish represent a multi-million dollar industry. But to many, the art of breeding and raising these beauties is priceless. The price of the koi varies. You know, it could start from somewhere from $50 up to uh, $20,000, $30,000, dollars 50000 They're like living jewels. Every koi is different. Each of these fish has to be handled with great care. When a buyer wants to purchase a koi, the tanks are usually drained to shallow water to catch the selected fish. And transporting the fish is an expensive and delicate process. The fish are put into large plastic bags, just like a goldfish, but from there, it's a little more complicated. This is how we ship fish, are in bags, bags like this with, with pure oxygen in them. What I'm doing is I'm taking out all of, the, all of the air, the ambient air out of the bag so I can put pure oxygen in there. Putting pure oxygen in the bag is better than just the regular air because there's no CO2. Yeah, without the oxygen, fish in the bag will last eh, maybe at most 10 minutes. With the oxygen in the bag like this, this fish will last till tomorrow morning. The art of raising koi has been refined over the years. The fish's history can be traced millions of years back to South China. But the Japanese were the first in recorded history to take the naturally occurring mutations and breeding them further for aesthetic appeal. Now koi fish lovers span the globe. I am from Chicago and I'm here in Hawaii taking care of the fish that I bought in Japan last October on a, a koi hunting trip. They were shipped here because they grow better in Hawaii than they do in Chicago. Hard to believe, I know. Hawaii's tropical climate makes it the ideal place to raise koi. The art of raising these fish has been a Kodama family secret. Yes, in Japan or Niigata might be the best place to breed koi, but Hawaii, in our opinion, is the best place to raise koi because First of all, water. The water is perfect, and the weather, the climate uh, is also perfect. In you know, a koi, they don't eat during the winter time, uh, but here in Hawaii, you know, we have literally no winter. In other words, we can keep feeding them throughout the year. They handpick the best koi fish in Japan and perfect them on their farm on Oahu. The results are beautiful. This is very popular variety because this is kind of a remind this is kind of a remind us of the Japanese flag. This is another koi that I purchased as two years old but I already sold them. So this is why I raised my customers koi. The food is a very important part of the koi beauty because you know they are what they eat. You know we had our own my father's original recipe which has raised uh, five grand champions when we were in Japan. So we kind of picked the recipe and developed from there. So it took us three years, you know, trial and errors, but now we're very happy. And this will bring uh, the white white and uh, the, will make the red really red. And, you know, I know exactly what they are uh, in it. So, you know, I can taste it and it's really kind of sweet. The time and care that goes into these fish can last more than a lifetime. Koi fish can live over 200 years and their beauty can be passed on for generations to come. There are many urban legends as to who invented the Frisbee. Some say it started with college students who tossed around pie plates. But one thing is for certain, as the disc caught on, it also became popular with our furry friends. You guys want to play with the Frisbee, huh? You want to play with the Frisbee? Okay, get it. In this segment, we learn the art of teaching our pooches the sport. So Australian Shepherds are working dogs and they can, they can just go all day. They can run, etc. So Frisbee is a really good game for them. They, they're really excited when they get to work. And something about the breed is that they, they really need something to do and you need active, uh, you know, active family, active uh, lifestyle if you, have a, if you have an Australian Shepherd. I want to get the Frisbee, there we go. 
Often the dog that is best at the Frisbee is any breed with lots of energy. So Gus was on death row. Um, he's a Reno street dog, and he's going to be euthanized the next day because he has a pit bull in him. We asked if we could take care of him for the weekend, and um, as soon as he came into our house, he jumped on our bed and was fell into our hearts. We realized he was going to be a great um, frisbee dog because we kept losing tennis balls in the winter time in Tahoe. So we switched to a frisbee at the dog park one day and just threw it up for him and he jumped and caught it and we both looked at each other and like we were Whoa. amazed we were <laughs> like, let's wow. try this now yeah so he was a complete natural <laughs> gus the frisbee dog <laughs> at a beach near you <laughs> everybody tells me man that looks so cute your dogs running out there they catch that disc they're smiling they're happy they're having a good time and let me tell you what goes through that dog's mind every time I throw a disc out of my hand. I'm going to kill it. That's what they think. They think I'm going to kill that disc. Dogs are natural born hunters. Prey drive is part of their DNA. Frisbees were originally designed for humans and meant to be caught with your hands. Since dogs use their mouths, there are a few things to keep in mind. I think playing frisbee catch with your dog is a great way to enjoy your dog, but there are a few things you have to be careful with and a few problems that we see in practice are, um, remember your frisbee is hard, so your dog is catching this frisbee with its face, so remember um, broken teeth are a problem sometimes from uh, dogs catching that hard frisbee. So you can try to get a soft frisbee, that'll help with that a lot. Remember also when your dog chews on the frisbee that it leaves little grooves in the frisbee and, and those little sharp bits of plastic that are left behind on the frisbee can cut your dog's uh, lips, uh, can cut your hands, things like that. So be a little careful with that. The other thing is that because your dogs are jumping, we get a lot of jumping injuries, which in particular lead to torn cruciate ligaments um, in the knees or hip problems. That's just with, with any athletic uh, dog, we see those kinds of injuries. But all in all, I think it's an awesome sport because it really brings owners and their dogs together in a team sport kind of way. You don't want to ever jump a dog until it's done growing. It's not done growing until it is a year old. I've got a, uh, a soft frisbee here. This kind won't hurt their um, teeth. I throw it low so that they um, don't jump up too high because they're very enthusiastic and that high jump they could fall and hurt themselves. You guys want to get the frisbee? Huh? Okay. When you want to teach a dog how to play frisbee, there are a few things to remember. Number one, you want to be excited. You want to be animated and you've got to ignite the pursuit like this. And the next thing is to develop the pursuit of it. So here we go. We're gonna go on a short drive, three teases and a, she's got it. So if you're interested in having your dog be a frisbee dog, um, I just suggest doing little tosses. Um, just kinda get them interested in the frisbee, get them excited about it, kinda show it off a little bit. Do a little bit farther each time. Um, and then as your dog gets a little bit more developed with a small toss, you can try to do longer tosses, see if he'll go for that. So one of the hardest parts with Frisbee is getting it back from them because they love to play tug of war with it. Um, and when you're training them, um, to, to have them bring it back, you give them treats when they drop it. And uh, with Ito, for example, if he drops it a little bit too far away, I tell him, get the Frisbee, and I reward him when he brings it right to me and drops it in front of me. Ito, get the Frisbee. <laughs> Good boy. Body language is a first line of communication, so we got to remember moving backwards to the dog means come to me. So if I move backwards, she comes. Keep in mind, not all dogs are the same. Some may be more laid back and need extra motivation, while others may be hyper and need help with their focus. Either way, it's a great way to build a bond with your dog. Remember, the key point for progress is making sure that you leave the game while the dog is still hungry for it. Never work the dog to complete exhaustion because that's what it'll remember the next time you come back out. So make sure you quit as the dog is going up. Practice makes perfect. And we're not just talking about your dog. It's a team effort. One of the problems is if you want your dog to be good at Frisbee, you have to be good at Frisbee. So when I botched the throw, that wasn't very good. 
doesn't show off his uh, talents. If I do just the right throw at the right level of speed, he can catch it just about every time. Really, uh, really good at it. It's a way to tire your dog out, and probably you too. So as soon as we get home from a frisbee session, he's completely content. I'll go right to the water bowl and um, lap up as much water as possible, and then lay. lay on the ground. We'll put a fan on him, and he's perfectly <laughs> happy just hanging out. But then give it about five hours, and he's ready to go again. Yeah, it's almost like he has OCD. I don't know if dogs have that, but uh, that's what it seems like if I had to diagnose it myself. Over time, you and your pooch will likely perfect the game and enjoy a new way to spend some quality time together.